interesting. So thank you everyone for coming along this afternoon. Uh, we've got um, Helen Miller um, who will talk to us about potential future wealth taxes. So Helen, can I pass you over please? Sure, yeah. Hello everyone. Let me say, I was just saying to Charlotte, I've, I've got some, um, some slides to share with you and I'm gonna set up some materials with sort of some big picture ideas about wealth taxes and how to think about them. But I'm very much hoping that I won't speak at you for an hour. My, my plan is very much to give you some big ideas and then to stop and have a discussion. Um, so I think that'll be a bit more interesting for all of you to kind of dig into the bits you're interested in. Um, so that's that's my broad plan. So let me let me start with some um, slides. So I'll mainly talk today about kind of should the UK have a wealth tax, by which I'm basically going to mean a tax on the annual stock um, of of wealth. But I thought we should kick off before thinking about the sort of nitty gritty of tax design with just kind of what is wealth. Um, and I think a lot of people are a little bit surprised when they see a chart like this. So this is basically saying, take all UK household wealth and look at what kind of wealth it is. And what it's showing you is that about 40% of wealth is property, so people's homes. Another 40%-ish is private pensions, so retirement savings. Um, only 13% is financial wealth, so you can think stocks and shares and bank accounts and things like that. And under 10% is physical wealth. So for most of us, that, that'll mean a car, but for the very rich, that'll be you know, where the yachts and the artworks and the Fabergé eggs and everything comes in. And I think many people will guess that the sort of physical wealth and financial wealth are bigger parts of the pie. Um, but this is, how, this is how wealth in the UK very broadly um, looks. I thought I'd also show you how this splits down across different types of wealth, specific different types of people, sorry. So this is just saying, line people up from the lowest wealth to the highest wealth, where the highest wealth is at the top, and look at how their wealth breaks down. And you can see there are some differences here, but the reason I'm showing you this is just to say that even at the top, take the very, very wealthiest people, most of their wealth is still in private pensions and housing. And this is a relevant context when you're thinking about you know, what wealth taxes and what you want to tax. It's not just a question about who you want to tax, it's also going to be a question about the types of assets you want to tax. And, and for example, whether you want to tax um, pensions and housing. I think a lot of people think of wealth tax as being taxes on you know, yachts and artwork and stocks and shares, but that is only a, a fraction of wealth. So that's just by way of, um, way of context. So back to the previous picture, I thought I'd just run through quickly how we currently tax these uh, stocks, because obviously we have a big system already um, of taxes. If you take property, then at the moment we have, you know, as, as I suspect you'll all know because you'll all be paying it, uh, council tax on house. So every year houses are subject to council tax. There's also a stamp duty, um, which is on the transactions, which is a different thing, but it's there in the background. Um, pensions in many ways are quite straightforward because people have pension pots, but they turn those pots by and large into income. And when they take that income, that income is taxed. So that's a big chunk that's taxed. We have taxes on most wealth in that case. Then on the yellow chunk, on the financial assets, there are dividend taxes and capital gains taxes, which I'll say a bit more about in a minute. And then on the physical assets, there are various things going on. So it depends on which kind of assets you're talking about and various ways to tax assets. So we do have some taxes on cars, for example, and other things. So that's a bit, there's more variety there. But big picture here, we already have taxes on quite a lot of the flows that come from this wealth. And that's going to be quite important because a recurrent theme here is going to be the extent to which we want to tax flows from wealth as opposed to the stocks of wealth um, uh, themselves. So before I get onto the stocks idea, let's just think about these flows and, and this yellow bit on the financial and dividends taxes. Um, I kind of wanted to flag in passing again as relevant context for what comes later that um, we do have dividend taxes and capital gains taxes. They're not perfect, but they could be much better. So let me show you another picture um, showing one of the reasons they're not perfect. This is just saying for different kinds, for different um, income brackets, whether you're a basic rate payer, a high rate taxpayer, a digital rate payer, um, and how you get your income. So whether it's employment income or other forms of income, what's your overall marginal tax rate? And the takeaway here is that the green bars are highest. So people who get their income from employment, whether they're a basic rate payer or a high rate payer, pay more, have higher tax rates than people who get their um, income from dividends or from capital gains, which is the final two bars. So we have very different tax rates on people's incomes depending on how that income um, is earned. And there are you know, a couple of problems um, with doing this. I suspect some of them are screaming out at you already. One is just the unfairness. So you have two people who earn exactly the same amount of income overall, 
uh, very different tax bills if one happens to get their income from dividends, say, rather than employment income. It also has sort of efficiency problems in that it affects how people choose to operate. So you know, we've done some research at IFS using all the tax records and you see that people who run their own companies choose to pay themselves in dividends or capital gains rather than salary in order to take advantage of the tax breaks. Now that's, you know, that's not legal, that's perfectly, it's a perfectly reasonable response to the tax system, but it means that people aren't necessarily making the choices that are best for them, they're making tax motivated choices. And we have to worry as well about things like, you know, too many people becoming self-employed um, because of the tax system. So there are various problems with how we currently tax the flows from this kind of wealth. This is just a recap of what I've said. At the same time, I haven't got a jazzy picture to show you this, I'm afraid, but at the same time, the way we design these taxes, dividends and capital gains taxes, means that actually the taxes are discouraging some kinds of investments. Um, and if you put the taxes up, you discourage those investments by more. And that's, we don't want to be doing that. Um, so we get into the nitty gritty of this, but what I wanted to flag right up front was that we could fix this. We could both adjust the design of the taxes so that they don't, they don't distort investment decisions, they don't stop investments happening. And then we could align overall tax rates. So the same, you know, everyone paid the same amount overall, regardless of um, how you got your income. So that's a, that's a relevant context because I think a lot of the problems we're going to come back to is um, about stock versus flows is how can we tax the flows? And we don't tax them perfectly at the moment, but we could tax them um, much better. So that's capital income taxes. Let's, let's jump on to the kind of the big meat for today, which is, you know, annual, should we have an annual wealth tax? Um, and I think a lot of people are motivated by pictures like this. I've just lifted this straight from the ONS website. And it's just showing you kind of inequality in wealth, effectively. It's lining people up upon the bottom um, based on how much wealth they have. And what you see is that people at the top of the distribution have a lot more wealth. So one statistic, the richest 1% of households had wealth of more than 3.6 million, whereas the least wealthy 10% had wealth of um, no more than about 15,000 pounds. So big distribution in wealth and wealth inequality. And it's often is the motivation people thinking about, well, we should wealth, we should tax wealth. And kind of the question I want to start with is, you know, are wealthy people better off? I think you look at a chart like this and you sort of say, well, obviously the answer must be yes, right? Someone with 3.6 million is obviously better off than someone with uh, 15,000 know, £15, pounds. Um, and if you follow the kind of line of argument, you know, in general, very broadly speaking, we have a tax system that says, you know, people with higher ability to pay should pay more. We tax people more if they have higher incomes. The idea being you have higher income, you, you know, you have a bigger ability to pay, you pay more tax. So why don't we tax people with uh, more wealth at a higher rate, i.e. isn't it obvious that we need an annual wealth tax? And the kind of the quick answer to that, I think, is no, actually, or as, as surprising as that sounds. And it's because a lot of wealth is what I'm going to call like life cycle savings. So if you imagine, I'm just thinking of this, if imagine that all of us declared all of our wealth to each other. You know, would you know which of us was wealth and was better off over their lifetimes? Now, if one of you sitting on 3.6 million, we'd probably be happy to conclude that you're, the, you're the, you know, the better off amongst all. But probably what you'd really find is that the younger we are, the less wealth we have. And those of you who are older and closer to retirement would have more wealth. But that wouldn't tell you whether you were richer than me overall in your lifetime. It would just tell you that you were closer to retirement and you'd paid off your mortgage more quickly or you, you know, you'd made a big pension pot. So the point is that when you look at wealth at a snapshot in time, you take two people, you don't necessarily see which person is better off overall. Mostly what you see is where they are in their life cycles and how close they are to retirement. So actually, somebody's wealth isn't necessarily a good indicator of how um, well off they are. Now, of course, we'll come back to the billionaires. If you've got three, you know, if you've got billions of pounds in wealth, you're obviously better off. So it's not, this doesn't hold for all points in time. But you know, the point how I want to get across here is that wealth isn't necessarily a good indicator of how well off um, uh, people are. And again, back to the picture I showed you originally, most wealth is housing and pensions. It's not financial wealth and, and yachts. So most wealth is people basically building up um, their housing and their retirement savings over their lifetime. And that's really at the core of the kind of the key argument against an annual tax on the stock of wealth. Very broadly, we can get into lots of details here, but very broadly, it's not a good idea to tax people just because they happen to save. You know, so if Charlotte and I earn the same income, 
but I really like spending my money on, I don't know, clothes for toddlers. And Charlotte actually, you know, likes saving because she wants to do something in the future. There's no reason for the tax authority to get involved in that decision. It doesn't mean that one of us is better or worse off. It just means we have different preferences. And, you know, if you started taxing, say, Charlotte at a higher rate just because she happened to like saving, it wouldn't only mean that she had a less incentive to save, it would mean that she actually might want to put less effort into working in the first place. If the reason she's working is because she wants to consume in the future, because she wants to, I don't know, retire earlier than I do, or she wants to do some start a business in five years' time. If you take more of her income away, then she has less incentive to do all of those things. So it's not just a simple case of the tax discouraging the saving per se, but what people want to do with that saving. So broadly, it's better off to just leave people to choose how much they want to save and when they want to spend their money. Uh, and just to tax their own sort of underlying capacity um, uh, instead. And again, one way to see this is that if, if you want to tax people who are better off at higher rates, which most people do in a progressive tax system, then it's better to target the income or all the consumption, but the people's, you know, how much they have um, overall, as opposed to how much they happen to be saving in a period of time. So that's, that's really the core of why, you know, if you ask most economists what the key argument against a wealth tax is, it's, it's this. Um, so that's the key argument against it. Let's, let's talk about what the arguments are in favour of a wealth tax, because you know, many people do put arguments forward. And let me note right up front that I'm going to sort of run through four um, rationales and potentially sound quite pedantic about why particularly you want one. But there's a really important reason for that, which is that the particular rationale that one favours for a wealth tax matters enormously for how it should be designed and who should be taxed. So what you definitely shouldn't do is say, well, you know, Helen told me four broad reasons why you might want one. I'm not sure which one holds, but one of them must hold. Therefore, let's have a wealth tax because it doesn't tell you who should pay the tax. Should we all be subject to the wealth tax? Should it be only those people who own more than one million, two million, five million, ten million, one billion? You know, what's the number? Um, and should it be all wealth? Should it exclude main homes? Should it include pensions? You know, what, what should be in and out of scope of the tax? And the only way to answer that question is to work out very precisely what it is we're trying to tax. So that's why I'm going to sort of go quite carefully through different rationales for a wealth tax, because I think it really would matter first order for the kind of tax you wanted to design at the end. With that caveat in mind, uh, let's go to the potential rationales. Um, so the first one, which is pretty nerdy and comes sort of out of the academic literature um, I'll have a bash at telling you about, is that what if people who save more are better off? So I just spent that time telling you that people who save more aren't necessarily better off, but they're just, they're just choosing when to spend their money. But actually some people would argue that the fact that you are saving a tool um, kind of shows, that tells the tax authority something about you. So what if actually, you know, Charlotte saves more than I do, um, but that tells you that actually she is smarter than I am or she's more patient, or she's more financially savvy. Um, but there's something about her that's not, it's not the saving per se, it's the fact that she's doing any saving at all um, that means that you know something about her over and above her income. If that's true, then the fact that she's a saver is a way for the government to target people who are higher ability, for example. But it has to, the key, the reason I've got, it's a very subtle argument, it has to be the key that it tells you more information about, say, Charlotte, than just knowing her income. So if once you know both of our incomes, you know as much as you possibly can, there's no more information in the fact that Charlotte likes saving. If actually you know we have our incomes, but then you know more about Charlotte because she's a saver, then by targeting savings, you can target people who are, you know, you say higher ability or have more patience or something. Um, but that is a very tricky argument uh, to make because actually we don't really know that. It, how do you ever know whether it's somebody's just preferences versus their underlying ability? You don't really is the answer. And even if there are some people for whom that's true, like they're more financially literate, they know about pension savings, they do more savings. Um, that's not true for everybody. So if you do tax those kinds of people, you're also taxing just regular savers who wanted to save for their retirement. So there is a trade off. You get you know, maybe you get to target some some better off people, but you also tax people who are just trying to save for their retirement. So even if you follow this sort of technical argument, um, it's not clear the benefits um, outweigh the costs. Now, I've, I've bothered putting that there, even though it's kind of nerdy, because I think some people often, you, you might hear people say, well, people who's ever better off. Um, 
and again, I think for the first order thing is like, no, that's not really true for most people. Um, and if it, it, you know, it needs to be true in a very specific sense for it to be the rationale uh, for attacks. But that's argument number one that's kind of you know, out there. Um, the second argument that I think is more popular in kind of you know, popular discourse is that, and this applies more to if you're thinking about you know, the billionaires and the people who are very rich, is what if there are, you know, what an economist would call negative externalities that flow from high levels of um, wealth. So you know, there's two examples of this that come up in the debate most often. So one is to do with status. So what if you know one of you out there is extremely wealthy and you know, you've got, I don't know, a nice big house and you have a very luxurious lifestyle and the rest of us feel bad about that. So you know it's a status issue and status is a relative thing, not an absolute thing. So we might all be very happy in our lives, we might have a nice standard of living, but the fact that one of you's got lots of wealth might make the rest of us feel bad. So you know, the wealth of the one person has you know, sort of negative consequences for other people. So if that's the case, then one can make an argument um, that we can tax the wealth to sort of offset those negative effects. And that's not to so say we should, but that is one line of argument. The other sort of form of exercise that comes up uh, quite a lot in discussion is uh, political donations. And this is a much bigger issue in the US because of the US system. But the argument goes, what if there are just very wealthy people who, because of their wealth, can buy political influence? That's bad for democracy, and therefore we should you know, tax their wealth in order to stop them doing that. But the key to these arguments, and the reason I've got here that it's more complicated than it sounds, is that in order for a wealth tax to be the correct tool for the government to use, it needs to be the case that these negative externalities are coming from wealth per se, not from the underlying incomes that create the wealth or that flow from the wealth or from the spending that you can do um, from the wealth. So think of political donations. It has to be the case that the power that somebody has comes from the fact they sit on their wealth. Actually, I think it's easier to make the case that the power comes not from the wealth per se, but from the fact that you can spend it. So you can put your money into somebody's campaign um, and, and then therefore you can buy influence. And in that case, what the government wants to target is not the wealth per se, it's the spending. Um, so you want to target spending on political, political campaigns. And in fact, in some ways, a wealth tax could backfire because if you tax wealth, you give people a bigger incentive to spend their wealth which could include more spending on, you know, luxury homes or political donations or things that cause the problems in the first place. So I think the point here is that one can make a principled argument that wealth can create negative consequences for others. But I think often it's used a little bit too loosely in the debate. And what people really want to tax is not the wealth per se. It's either the income that created the wealth in the first place or it's the spending that that wealth allows people to do. And in that case, the government should be targeting income or spending effectively. Um, but they're, they're the two, I think, you know, biggest principled arguments sort of from a tax design perspective. Whereas if you were starting, you know, get an economist to design a tax system from scratch, when would they ever put an in, when would they ever put a wealth tax into the tax system? It would, it would be because for one of these two reasons. Um, now, my personal view is that they're not good enough reasons for us to have a wealth tax. I think one is, um, can hold in some very specific circumstances, but isn't general enough to make it a good proposition. And I think a lot of the problems with two are better dealt with, with things like regulations on political spending or taxes on consumption than they are on a wealth tax. But they are the two, um, the two key arguments. The other kind of arguments that I thought I would um, kind of share with you broadly is a kind of the second best argument. So it says, you know, it's all very well for an economist to sit there and say, Imagine a blank sheet of paper. Imagine we can tax all incomes properly and we tax all spending. And we've got an inheritance tax that works. You know, you don't need a wealth tax, um, but that's not the world we live in. The world we live in is one in which incomes kind of aren't taxed properly. So I showed you already the differences between tax rates, for different kinds of income. That's, you know, it's true in the UK. It's true in many countries. It's been true for a very long time. So the kind of question one can ask is, well, if you take the current tax system as given, um, do you want a wealth tax um, on top of those taxes? So if you think that lots of people get income from capital gains and dividends, we know that those incomes are disproportionately flowing to people who are wealthier. Um, if you can't tax the income properly, let's have a wealth tax instead, is effectively the answer. 
Um, but what I'm going to argue to you, and people disagree on this, so this is my opinion, but um, I think a well test is a kind of a poor second best. So if we really can't do anything else, um, maybe we have to go for this. But I think it's I think we should really try harder to tax incomes properly. And the reason I think that one of the reasons, at least, but one of the big reasons is that a wealth tax isn't very targeted at people who get high returns to their wealth. So let me show you an example so you can just see what I mean. I'm going to show you a simple example, but it's a broader point. So imagine you have two people. I'm going to call them A and B. Could be anybody. We both got hundred pounds in assets. This could be a billion pounds. It doesn't matter. Um, Imagine you both get a return of five pounds. So think of this, you've got some, you know, basically boring savings. You shove them in a bank or, you know, an ISA, you get your return. And these are just people who are, you know, not doing anything particularly exotic. They're just saving for their retirement or to buy a house or for their kids' college or something like that. Well, you can design a wealth tax and a capital gains tax to achieve the same outcome. So just again, simple example, if you had a 20% income tax uh, on capital income tax, they'd both pay a pound because 20% of five pounds is a pound. Or you could tax the stock, the hundred pounds, and at 1% annual wealth tax, you'd both pay a pound in tax. So if what you want to do is tax these people, you could do it equivalently through a capital gains tax and an, income, and, a, and an annual wealth tax. There is some equivalence between tax and stocks and flows. But now imagine that actually person B is different. Person B is going to be somebody who actually is not just having their money in a bank, they're making maybe complicated financial decisions about investing in the stock markets or new companies, or they're doing something that means they get a big return. So they're gonna get 20 pounds. And economists often call this kind of an excess return. So it's not just shoving your money in a bank, you've done something that gets you a big return. And this could be all sorts of things. I mentioned maybe it's that they're just financially, maybe they're just good at investing. Maybe they got lucky. Maybe they put money into, I don't know, some venture capital trust. Um, Maybe they found a business that had monopoly profits and they got some, you know, some rent somewhere. It's all sorts of reasons, but they're getting more money. And we know from various data sets that these kinds of excess capital returns, when people get big returns on their invest on their wealth, um, are skewed towards the top of the distribution. So very broadly speaking, you know, people like me, normal people, um, you know, tend to get relatively modest returns on their wealth people at the very top are more likely to get these kinds of big returns for various reasons. And I think there's a good reason to want to tax those returns at higher rates. Now, there's a few reasons for that. One is that actually um, taxing higher returns at higher rates is less distortionary. It's less bad for investment than taxing low returns. Um, but also, if you think about trying to target people at the top, I said that they're the ones who are getting some of these big returns. But now think about what these different taxes do. So a capital income tax, again, at 20%, person A is going to pay the same amount, a pound. Person B now pays four pounds. They pay a bit higher tax rate. With a wealth tax, that's not true. These two people still pay a pound in tax. And this is, this, again, this is a simple dummy example to show you what I mean when I say a wealth tax doesn't target people with high returns. So, you know, person B probably loves the idea of a wealth tax because they'd rather pay their pound on their wealth than their four pounds on their income return. Um, but if we want to target people with high returns, you simply can't do that with a wealth tax. It's just not possible. Now, of course, some of you would be thinking, well, but what if you know person B um, saves that, saves his 20 pounds and then you know he or she invests it again in the future? Well, of course, yes, if it gets wrapped into their wealth, then you can tax the wealth in future. But that, that all that means is that you can tax people who save. So for the people who get wealth and they spend it you don't get to tax it with a wealth tax. Um, whereas with a capital income tax, you can tax it regardless of how they spend it. It doesn't matter what they do with it afterwards. You've, you've kind of got the money up front from the government's point of view. So again, you, you could make many more complicated examples, but I just wanted to show you that, you know, if you're, when, you're tax, when you're taxing wealth, you're not taxing people with high returns more, uh, which I think is sort of an undesirable feature. Um, um, and you know, my personal takeaway from that is that, you know, imagine you follow this second best argument. You start with a system where incomes aren't taxed properly. Therefore, you add a wealth tax to try to sort it out. Even when you've got a wealth tax, I personally would still want to fix capital income taxes because I still want to target taxes on the people who are getting the most income. So from my point of view, um, a wealth tax doesn't remove the, the need or desirability of fixing income taxes. 
Moreover, it's certainly not obvious to me that it would be easier um, uh, to, um, this is the other way around. It's not easier to add a wealth tax and to fix capital income taxes. Um, so it's not the case that you think, well, we can't do that, let's do a wealth tax, it's easier. I don't think a wealth tax is easier. And I'll come back to that in, in, in a little bit. But that is one second best kind of argument. I think it's kind of common um, out there. And so some of the US stuff is really about this. It's kind of a, if we can't fix income taxes, let's just do a wealth tax at the top. Um, let me know in passing, but I have to come back to this if people are interested in it, that you get similar issues with inheritance tax. So people's views on inheritance tax are sharply divided. Some people think it's the best tax ever, some people hate it um, for you know, philosophical reasons. Um, but regardless, if you, want a, if you want an inheritance tax, you may be unhappy that the current inheritance tax has plenty of loopholes in it, and often the very rich can avoid it um, in, in various ways. Um, and then some people say, well, if you can't fix inheritance tax, let's do a wealth tax instead. But similarly, a wealth tax and an inheritance tax have different effects and affect different people. So, you know, people who spend their wealth during their life, um, you know, might still pay a wealth tax, but wouldn't pay an inheritance tax, for example. So they're not perfect substitutes. And again, it's not obvious to me that it's easier to do a wealth tax than it is to fix inheritance tax. So, again, my starting point would be if you want an inheritance tax, and you don't like the current inheritance tax, let's fix it before we think about trying to find some second best tax to, to patch it up. Again, we can come back to that. Um, and the, the final sort of argument, which again is the second best argument, imagine we can't have the perfect thing, is you know, incomes weren't taxed properly in the past. Um, so I think lots of people, I think of the, I guess billionaires are an easy example, but I think of people who got wealth, they may have spent their entire careers earning capital gains and dividends and paying lower tax rates than we might think was you know, ideal or correct. And therefore, some people will say, well, I've got more, I've got more wealth than they should ever have been able to accumulate because they should have been paying more tax along the way. And of course, even if you fix income taxes today, that's not going to help with the fact that all this income is, they, they've got it in their bank already. They've got, they've got away with it. So what do you do about that? And one answer people give is to say, well, let's tax those stocks of wealth as a way to sort of correct the fact that those wealth stocks shouldn't have got so high in the first place. Again, you know, valid line of argument, um, but worth pointing out that again, not perfect because people would pay less tax, for example, if they spent their wealth more quickly. So you aren't gonna be able to, you, you basically can't undo the past perfectly. If somebody got away with really low taxes, but they spent all their wealth, you can't get them, you can't tax them on their wealth, they haven't got any left. Um, and of course, because you're taxing both sort of the old stock of wealth and all the new wealth and all the new accumulation, you have all the problems that come with taxing new wealth, including, as we talked about, discouraging savings and investments. So again, it's a, there's a trade-off there and it, policymakers have to decide sort of how much they want to offset the past versus how much they want to discourage the future. And that's, and that's tricky. Um, however, I think if we are thinking about trying to it offset things in the past, or more generally, if we just want to raise some revenue for some reason, I think a much more attractive proposition than an annual wealth tax is a one-off wealth tax. And while they sound kind of similar, they are actually pretty distinct. So the key thing about a one-off wealth tax is that if it's genuinely unexpected, so nobody anticipates it, nobody's changed their behavior, think it's coming in, and they genuinely believe it's one-off, so they really think that it's not gonna happen again, then in some ways, that is an amazingly good way to raise revenue from the government's point of view, because you don't discourage anyone's behaviour. And no one changes how much they work or save or what they do, because they can change anything. And it won't affect their tax bill, because it won't affect how much wealth they've already got and therefore what they're charged tax on. And because they think that there'll be no tax in future, it won't lead them to change you know, what they do in future. Now, I've put you know, things in bold metallics here because these are big criteria. It has to be genuinely believed to be one off um, and genuinely unexpected. So the government. We might do it again. Did you lose me? Yeah, sorry. I think I think me? it just just froze. Yeah. Um, do, do you mind just saying that again, please? Yeah, how much did you lose? I was, I was cracking on, but I did. I, I realized I was just frozen. How much did you lose? Um, I, I think we were, we were at that the first bullet point, and we were just saying that you know the, the, there has to be a real belief that it's it's one off. 
Brilliant. Yeah. So if, if the government announced basically that you know next year there'll be a wealth tax, um, or we're going to do it as a trial, maybe we'll do it again, then you wouldn't have these nice properties. People would be moving their wealth out of the UK, and they'd be thinking, "Well, I'm going to spend my wealth today, so you can't tax it tomorrow." Um, so the sort of the nice properties of a one-off wealth tax only exist if it's really unexpected and it is one-off. But these have been done in the past in various contexts, so it's it's not mad to think that this is possible. Um, and there are various ways you could motivate um, wanting a one-off wealth tax. So you know, I just talked about the um, this concern that some people have that incomes are taxed, you know, not properly in the past. Let's offset that. Now I said you can't perfectly offset past policy mistakes because again, people spent their wealth, you can't tax them. But if you're worried that we've got some big billionaires or millionaires that've got wealth that should should have been taxed higher in the past, you rather than tax them every year and have the problem, just do a one-off tax. Just say today we're going to tax you on 10% of your wealth and that's your tax bill. And you, you could even do things like spread it out the payments. So you haven't got to make them sell their wealth today. You could say, here's your tax bill, you've got 10 years to pay it or something like that. But you, 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 you know, you design the tax based on the wealth on, on that day. Um, so the one-off wealth, I think it's kind of an attractive idea if you want revenue. And other things you could do is like related to COVID or you know, wanting to reduce inequality or something. Um, I think the question here really boils down to, you know, if you can do one, if you think you can make it unexpected and believable, should you? And there is no right answer there. It depends entirely on what you think of as fair. So some people think a one-off tax is very fair because it hits the wealthiest. Other people will think it's horribly unfair and retrospective. And people just differ on that. And there's no, you know, there's no, there's no economist answer there. It's just that people have different views about the world. And I expect you'll have different views. Um, and of course, your view will determine whether you think it should be everyone who pays the wealth tax, only billionaires, only millionaires, you know, should houses be included or excluded, should pensions be included, and, you know, and so on and so on. So people have different views on um, if a wealth tax, a one-off wealth tax is fair, and if so, how to design one. But if you can do it, then in principle, you know, the sort of economics of it is simple. It just comes down to fairness. Um, and the economic, I mean, I think there's the, the one point just to get across is that there are less distortions from one-off tax than there are from an annual tax. So you can sort of get to have some of the benefits of taxing these people without the ongoing cost of doing it every year. So before I stop to chat, let me just end by saying, um, you know, a bit about administration. You know, could we administer a wealth tax? The reason I'm raising this is because a lot of the discussion among academic economists and disagreement about whether we should have one comes down to could we actually do it? And let me say in a nutshell, the answer is yes, but don't underestimate how hard it would be. Just to flag a few issues, and these are a few among many, we don't currently have data on people's wealth. So the government would have to start a brand new data collection on all wealth. Uh, so that's, that's a non-trivial task. And of course, unlike income, where you get information from employers, this would need to be income. This would be the information that every individual gives you about their entire wealth portfolio. It's a lot of information. And some wealth is just very hard to value. Even if people are being honest, valuing a private business that's not traded publicly how do you do that? Really hard. So there are there are methods, but it's very difficult. Um, and of course, another thing is that people can move their assets in response to a tax. So I probably, you know, I'm not going to be doing that. But if you've got a billion pounds, actually getting advice to move it offshore is pretty simple. So um, you have to be wary that people can move assets in various ways um, in response. And then just a flag that, you know, I think we could do it, but it'd be hard. No country has ever raised very large sums from a wealth tax, no, you know, some non-trivial sums, but nobody's got away with having a really large wealth tax, either because they're not willing to put most people in the wealth tax. And once you narrow it to just a billionaires, you know, there aren't very many of them. So even if you tax them quite a lot, you don't get very much revenue and people can move their assets if you have big taxes. So I think it's worth being realistic about um, what we can achieve. So we could do one, but it's not gonna revolutionize our tax. We'll, we'll still need to tax income and consumption and everything else we currently tax. Um, but let me stop there after that with stop tour, and then we can um, pick up um, the bits you're most interested in. Great, wow, thank you so much, Helen. Um, so uh, everyone on the call, if, if you have any questions, um, either feel free to kind of raise your hand um, and, and we'll kind of go in chronological order or, or raise it in the chat. Um, either option is good. Does anyone have any preliminary questions? Okay. I've, I, I, oh, Brendan. Yeah. Do you want to go? Oh, no, I'll, I'll bite. Um, 
Uh, I'm I'm no economist. I you know I, not much that you said was beyond me. But um, I, I'm interested in how you approach this because um, almost everything you said is about the the technical minutiae of how to make this work and what the after effects are of all these measures. But you you moved very quickly past the sort of ethical reasoning. And, you know, for me, there are two reasons for a wealth tax. One is to eliminate misery at the bottom of society. So society needs that money. And the second is to create the best society for all. Um, and uh, I'm sure, you know, there's evidence showing that um, the wider the income gap between top and bottom, the, the less happy the society is in general. So um, I, I haven't got a set of ideas for how one might do it, but I'm wondering if you had a good enough description of what we wanted to achieve, including the things I've said, you could design a system which most closely achieved that. Yeah. Would that be a doable challenge? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, maybe I should start with this. So I guess the way I think about tax design very broadly is to say you know, people will differ in their preferences over redistribution. And I'm not going to, you know, that's, that's a, a political choice, basically. And you and I will differ, and that's fine. Um, but for any given level of distribution, um, by which I mean, you know, how much you take from the top and how much you give to the bottom, then the question, kind of the tax design question is, how do you do that um, best through the tax system? And one way to see what I was arguing is to say, you know, broadly, and I'm saying broadly because we could get into philosophical arguments about exactly what this means, but people tend to think that you want to tax people with a higher ability to pay at higher rates. So if you earn twice as much income as I do, you should pay a higher tax rate under most, most people's idea of fairness because you've had more income, you're more able to pay, you're better off. Um, and therefore, if you have a system that taxes people who are better off more, you take more from the top. And if you have a system that then you can, through benefits, give more to the bottom. Um, and basically what I was arguing is that I think it's better, and I, I say I think, there's good evidence for this, um, it tends to be better to do that via taxes on incomes or consumption rather than on stocks of wealth. Because I think flows of income are a better measure of people's sort of underlying abilities um, or like underlying how well they off they are than wealth at a point in time. So, yeah, again, like you and I can have different incomes and different wealths. I think our incomes would tell us more about where we are in sort of overall lifetime income distribution than our wealth would. So by taxing income, you get closer to taking more from the better off, basically. Um, I think where that, you know, some of the arguments are about what if that's not true? I don't think those arguments are very strong. I, I think the evidence suggests that income is a better measure of underlying capacity. Um, the other arguments for wealth taxes are about what if that's not enough? So what if you have, you have my design, my income tax system and people with higher incomes pay higher tax rates, you take more from the top, you give more to the bottom. What if there's still sort of too much at the top? Do you want to take, um, you want to take more wealth at the top? And that could be for these negative externalities, like you just think people are miserable because they see the higher wealth. And that is a form of argument for a wealth tax. You could layer on top of it. And that would suggest to have a tax just on the people you think are problematic, so just on whatever it's going to be, billionaires or you know, high millionaires or something. So um, but I think the starting principle to say, you know, tax people who are better off, I think incomes get you there. Um, but, but with the caveat that we don't do that well at the moment because we have different taxes on different incomes. So, you know, I think a system where you have lower taxes on capital gains and dividends is a problem for that because the rich kind of get, get around it by putting their income into capital gains and dividends. Does that make sense? Help? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you clearly know uh, way more technicalities than I do, but just briefly, because we haven't got much time, um, I don't quite buy it um, because the, the fundamental um, wealth in, you know, historically has been from ownership of land. And the people who own land now, and I'm sure many of us on this call know about um, the, how, how little change in the ownership of land there has been in Scotland, for instance, over many hundreds of years. Um, the, the people who now own that land are basically the descendants of the violent psychopaths of the past who were willing to steal from others and kill. Um, so like land value taxation, which is not a tax on income, uh, is, is, is often advocated to, um, to address that. And the, the other point is that uh, is, is the, the public is, is, is far more left wing when presented uh, with the, these questions in the right way. You know, the tax system doesn't take enough from the top to give to the bottom. 
if you ask the public what they think society ought to be like and so on, there, there's evidence around that. And so, so, you know, for me, it's grotesque that there should be such inequality, that there is such misery. I don't, I don't buy the jealousy argument. I don't think that's relevant. But the fact that some have so much, much when some have so few is, is morally wrong. And we ought to design tax around that somehow or other. And I, you know, you probably answered that in some way. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, let me say so quickly, so I'll just talk about it as well. I mean, so land, I, I wouldn't exclude land value tax. In fact, I, we often said that land tax is, value tax is a good idea. We should tax land values. I think a lot of the problems with land in particular are these historic problems. So I think we either need to, inheritance tax is one way to fix that because they have to get some, everyone dies at some point, they have to be passed on. Um, or again, one-off tax. We could have a one-off tax just on wealth, hold, on land holdings, for example. Um, I think that would be more efficient that rather than a wealth tax on everything, do a specific tax on land of a certain value. I think that would be one way of, of overcoming the problems you're talking about there. Um, and you're right, people do um, uh, worry about inequality, I think for perfectly valid reasons. And I think what I would say is that you know, wealth taxes, again, never raise very much. We could raise really quite a lot from higher income taxes. So I think if, you, if your goal is to get more revenue to spend on the bottom, which is, again, perfectly fine goal, um, I think you'll get more money if you put up taxes on capital gains, partnership profits, um, dividends, than you will if you have an annual tax on wealth holdings. So partly it's, a, I think, to achieve the kind of the left wing thing you mentioned, you just get it better through income taxes. Um, Uh, we, we then have a, a question from C. Hughes. I'm sorry, I'm, I hope you don't mind if I, I read the question out. Um, so would you regard the capital income to be somewhat on the same spectrum as a Tobin type, so financial transactions, tax or complementary? Uh, yep, so uh, the short answer is no, they're different. And I think of them differently. So um, a capital income, assuming I know what you mean. So a capital income tax, I'm thinking of, you know, um, Income is just like any other income. So you do some work or you, um, you know, you invest in something and some income flows from that. And sometimes the income is wages, sometimes it's dividends, sometimes it's capital gains. And what I'm basically saying is the tax, the tax collector shouldn't care how the income arose. If you earn £100, you should be taxed in the same way, regardless of whether it came from dividends or salary. Now, you can think of arguments why it might not be true, but the minute you have different tax rates, you have lots of people who set up companies and pay themselves in capital gains. And I know that happens, I've seen the data on it. So, um, you know, so capital income taxes are really about taxing flows of incomes. The Tobin, the transactions taxes are different because they're just saying, take a, take, a trans, take a changing of hands of assets and let's tax an asset just because it's changed hands. So. There's no necessarily value creation. Nothing really has changed in the world. We swapped assets and you tax that. And I think those kinds of taxes are very problematic. In fact, so take an example that's easier for people to think about because you, you'd all have paid it as a space stamp duty on houses. So I think that is potentially the worst tax we have in our system because it means that, you know, say Charlotte and I want to basically change houses. I want to move, you know, to where Charlotte lives and she wants to move where I live, but our jobs change. Um, so nothing's really changed in the real world. A bit like I haven't got richer, I haven't earned any money. I just want to move to Charlotte's house. We get taxed just for that transaction. So now maybe I won't change my job and Charlotte won't change her job, but just because we can't afford to pay that transaction. So it slows down transactions in a way that's undesirable. And it isn't taxing richer people more because rich people don't necessarily pay more transactions taxes overall. So it's a, it's a badly targeted way to target rich people. Um, it just slows slows down movement in the economy. So I think capital income taxes, yes, very good idea, we should design them properly. Transaction taxes, no, we should scrap them in a nutshell. I have a question, if it's okay. Uh, just around, I guess like you've kind of mentioned um, that the solution is like taxing income. Um, and I kind of, to be honest, kind of agree. It's kind of what I had in my head when I came in to the chat as well, but I think I guess what what would you say are the main blockers like what's stopping us from having that like ideal system is it just policy is it just persuading people that they need to change it or yeah i don't know what do you think yeah so i think it's a good question i think there's a few things going on um so i think if you from a sort of i'll start with the technical stuff and i'll get to the politics on the technical side i think one of the problems is that um you know business incomes are different so you know, if, if i i go to ifs and i work i don't really spend anything 
on work, you know, I've got no big investments. I get my salary, it's easy to tax it. If I had my own business, I'd also be spending money on, you know, machines, office equipment, training for my staff, all that kind of stuff. So we want people to be able to deduct all of those costs. And at the moment, the way we do our tax base doesn't really work wonderfully. So that I have a discouragement from doing some of those kinds of investments. So policymakers think they face a trade-off because they have, you know, they want to put up tax rates on capital gains, for example, for, for the kind of equality reasons that Brendan was talking about. But they do that, and then they realise that, oh dear, we've we've now got you know less investment, and oh god, that's really bad. That's bad. Let's put rates down. And let's, I haven't got it with me, but I've got a nice chart of capital gains tax rates going up and down over time as different policymakers think, oh god, inequality, put it up. Oh god, investment, put it down. And I think they've got themselves stuck in that. And the reason that they're trying to, struggling to get unstuck is because the things should, we could fix the tax base. People like me know how to do it. But it means changing lots of bits of the tax code in fairly technical ways, which is just hard. You know, you don't get a sun headline saying, you know, government made lots of technical changes to the tax base. Woo! Doesn't wasn't work. So I think it's much easier to say, oh, we'll just take, we'll just tweak the rate and not do the big reform. Um, so I think that's a real you know, if you aren't going to do the reforms, there is really a trade-off there and it's really hard. Um, but I think we just need to keep pushing to try to get the reforms to the tax base so that basically we'd have, we'd have our higher, have, have our cake and eat it, we'd have our higher rates without the discouragement. So I think there's, there's a genuine, there's a genuine problem at the core of, of the core of that. It's also hard because when you talk about capital income taxes, you're affecting kind of the heart of the tax system because it's not just employees that get affected, it's employees, businesses, large companies, small companies, sort of everyone comes together in at these taxes so sort of everyone's upset by them almost if you just if you just change a bit of tax there's a small group that's upset i think it's easier to manage a small group than, than everybody being upset um and then of course it's just standard political lobbying that you know rich people would pay higher taxes and they don't like it and that that's that they're going to therefore campaign against it but i think the core of the problem really is this point about um not wanting to discourage investment and not finding the political capital to do the sort of harder reforms to the tax base that would be needed um, but look what i will say is you know I've, I've i've been doing this i don't know for I don't know, 14 years now something like that in that time i think there has been more acknowledgement of that problem and more willingness among professional circles to think hard about it and think it's the right solution so whereas maybe 10 years ago people sort of thought oh she's got an academic point she's you know she just you know ignore her textbooks I think now it's more of like, no, actually, that's right. We, we don't know how to do it yet, but there's more acknowledgement that it's the right answer. So I'm sort of mildly optimistic that the debate is in a better place. We're not there yet. It's not going to be fixed tomorrow. But I think I think the dial has shifted towards people understanding at least the problem if they're not willing to do the solution yet. So I'm I'm sort of mildly optimistic that there's, there's a the direction is improving, um, but we've got a long way to go. Thank you. Great. Does, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, uh, could I? Oh, yes, uh, please. You know, like you've spoken about the, the wealth and the income, but there's also the expenditure. So, you know, like value-added tax, that's generally a flat late rate, albeit sometimes a, a lower rate for some items. But could that not be used for higher value items? Those that have got wealth are the ones that can afford something at £10,000 or £100,000. So could you have about VAT or some sort of rate that means that they need to pay 40% 40, 40 when they're buying something of a high value? Yep. Yep. So good question. So I think um, the very broad answer is yes, taxing um, spending is a good, good way to, in fact, think about it, think very broadly about an individual's entire lifetime. All the income they earned has to be the you know, spent or passed on at death. So in some ways you can get equivalent results by either taxing everyone's income or taxing everyone's spending and their, inher and their bequests. Um, and you can sort of get equivalent systems. So um, in that sense, I think of taxing spending and income as being complementary. You can tax it on either end, basically. Um, in general, VATs, I, I, I tend to favor just flat rate VATs because policymakers tend to try to use them to help poor people. And they are horrible ways to help poor people. Because although, you know, yes, poor people spend more on fuel, for example, a share of their budgets, the rich spend more overall on fuel and food and stuff. So, you know, to give you a statistic, we spend about 50 billion pounds on lower rates of VAT for 
fuel and food and that kind of thing. Um, most of that helped people who are better off. If instead we had a flat 20% rate and took that 50 billion, you could do what I think Brendan has in mind, like you know, help people through the benefit system or help them directly at the bottom. So at the moment we're spending that 50 billion very inefficiently in terms of helping poor people. Um, to your idea about the, at the top, could you do like luxury taxes at the top? Um, I think the broad answer is yes, you could. Um, it's pretty hard to define exactly what you should put it on. So things like, you know, artwork and yachts would be kind of easy and you could do that. Um, it's hard to do it more broadly on spending that doesn't affect other people because, you know, the rich don't, they, they buy different stuff, but not that different stuff often. Um, but there are other ways to design expenditure taxes so that when people spend the money, you could tax them more. So, you know, not through a VAT, but through, to give you an extreme example, since you're, you know, you're talking about the future, you could tax people um, on money as it comes to a bank account and you could tax at a progressive rate, for example. So if I take money in my bank account, I get an excellent rate. And if you're richer than me, you get a higher rate, um, to give one example. So I think, I think the answer to your question is, yes, consumption is a good way to think about it, but we don't need to think narrowly just about the VAT. You can think sort of creatively about other ways to tax spend it, spending um, that could be skewed towards people with higher incomes or spending or whatever you fancy. So, but I think, I think that, that line of thinking of tax and spending or income is more productive than thinking about taxing stocks per se. So I think I sort of think you're on the right track with that. I think, you know, I think we should think in future about how we can tax spending and our incomes more differently, more efficiently. Great, thank you. Um, so just five minutes ago, so I'm, I'm just gonna ask, I suppose one, one hopefully probably more difficult than um, I imagine, um, but just to put it on the, the, the futurist slant to it. So we've talked about potential introductions to tax systems, tweaking some of the existing ones. In your, I suppose this is much more kind of in, in your opinion for the future of taxation, when might we see some changes and perhaps what might be most likely to change? You mean overall in tax? Um, or, or perhaps just with, with the kind of the, the wealth view remit or, you know, perhaps, you know, kind of capital income taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, I, you know, I think it's really hard to tell. I mean, so if you think about the big pressures that are coming down the track, there are a few things going on. I think one is that, as Brendan highlighted, people are increasingly concerned about inequality and not inequality in general. Because actually, that hasn't really changed very much in the last decades, but inequality right at the very top. And, and about you know the top one percent of income earners or wealth holders or whatever so i think there is more societal awareness of that and concern about the effects that may have um on on various factors so there is some political pressure to say let's change this i think people are increasingly aware of the differences in tax rates across different types of incomes and again 10 years ago people would say things like well that's good entrepreneurs need help and they need to be we need to be encouraging risk takers and we love small businesses um i think people are sort of seeing that's not that, that, that's a bit of a naive view in that yes you don't want to discourage investment and innovation that doesn't mean you have to give rich people big tax breaks and if you look at who is in the top one percent getting these tax breaks there's a lot of like partners in hedge funds in the financial services in london it's not big investors and entrepreneurs so i think people are people's views about who the rich are are um changing so i think from society's point of view there's more pressure to change from the government's point of view, some other big things are happening, like um, uh, population is changing, we're ageing, um, we're going to need to spend more on health and social care to maintain living standards, that means we're going to need to find more money, and it's very hard to think about how we find more money without raising taxes, because you can't, you can keep cutting back other services, but we've cut back quite a lot. Um, things like, as we move to electric vehicles, we'll lose about 35 billion in fuel duties, um, we can have other green levies, but save our billions quite a lot of money. Um, so I think the, from the government's point of view, they're going to have to start looking at how to raise more just to, just to keep our living standards as they are currently. And I think once you're thinking about how to raise more, you know, the easy thing to do in any one year is to tweak an income tax rate or a NICS rate, a national insurance rate, because it's, you know, you just fiddle with it. But if you're starting to look for like 35, 40, 50 billion, you don't tweak rates and get 50 billion. You have to do something bigger. So I think the combined pressure of society wanting change and government needing money to, just to pay the bills means they'll look more seriously at reform. So my hope is that um, we'll get more serious reform of capital income taxes. I don't see the UK introducing a wealth tax. Um, even if there is political pressure in some parts, 
simply because I think the government minister would go to HMRC, look at it and say, wow, that's a very expensive tax to administer. It's going to cost a lot of money just to set the system up and collect all the data and collect the thing. And we may get five billion. That's a lot of effort for five billion. Whereas if you go, you know, if you do other big reforms, you can think about big money. So I suspect we won't see wealth taxes. We may see, you know, maybe things like land value taxes or taxes on specific goods, maybe different consumption taxes in the in the distant future. But I don't see a general annual wealth tax. I think more likely we'll get tweaks to capital taxes, tweaks to, inher to inheritance tax, basically improvements what we've got um, rather than brand new taxes. But, you know, I haven't got a crystal ball, so, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see. I hope we get something. I mean, the, the current system is definitely in need of improvement. So I think if we have the current system again in 10 years, 15 years, that would be really pretty disappointing. Excellent. Fab. Thank you so much. Um, I'm aware we're, we're one minute to two, so um, we probably don't take any more uh, questions. So thank you everyone for coming along. And Helen, thank you so much uh, for the talk. Uh, just a, a quick plug for Edinburgh Futurists. We have our, um, our book club next week um, uh, with the Food of the Gods. And today I've put up uh, next month's book club and um, we're having an in-person event in Edinburgh. So um, hopefully um, pe some people are, are able to attend it. Um, but thank you so much, um, yeah, for everyone coming along today and have a, a lovely rest of the day. Great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.